My name is Stuart Schwartz. I'm a professor in the history department, and I'm teaching Brazilian history. Uh, so I've been asked to uh, introduce our speaker for today, Daniel Stroh, uh, who is president of the University of São Paulo, a new student in Brazil. He has his MA degree, I'm sorry, his PA degree from the University of São Paulo, but his MA and PhD from the University in Jerusalem. Uh, he uh, works in economic history in Brazil, uh, and uh, I won't bore you with uh, all the distinctions and, uh, and honors, uh, but I should mention uh, his uh, book, The Sugar Trade, Brazil, Portugal, and the Netherlands, was published recently by the United, uh, in the United States by Stanford University Press. Um, I happen to have the Portuguese version of but the format is exactly the same as this, and so I will pass it around uh, while we speak. It's really a rather remarkable publication event, which I'll just show you the way this was done. But as you can see from the format of this book, uh, it's really pretty spectacular. Uh, and uh, it was uh, the next to Stanford picked up the book and format as it was published in Brazil. Uh, and as published in the name, so I can pass it around this way. We slide it on the table so you don't have to lift it. Those of you who are challenged. Uh, and so, Ken uh, is a specialist in economic history and has worked on the Brazilian sugar trade and is going to speak to us today about that uh, topic in a talk called The Brazilian Sugar Trade and the Formation of the Early Modern Atlantic World. Uh, He'll speak for a while, and then we'll leave some time for questions and discussion. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming the speaker, Ben Easton. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the for inviting me here. Uh, it's a great honor being here at Yale. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank Bayer, who spent a lot of effort and time organizing this during a very uh, hectic period in his life and career. Well, so uh, let's proceed uh, with the uh, lecture. Uh, the you, okay, he's working. You might. Uh, the sugar production, and I don't know where you're familiar with that. If you're not very familiar about sugar production in Brazil, I suggest you should buy tourist <laughs> book and learn more about it. I'll think there are very few. So, uh, in the uh, late 16th and early 17th century, and from then on, sugar production transformed dramatically the landscape of Brazil. Uh, it caused great devastation of rainforest to plant sugarcane and also for uh, uh, firewood that was required for boiling the sugarcane juice uh, for most of the months of the year and often across, uh, across the clock, the, the whole 24 hours. Uh, and sugar was perceived from the onset by the crown, its agents, and also the investors and the first settlers as the main means to ensure uh, a sustainable European settlement in this so European land, uh, but in the new world. And, and so uh, it was done. The planting uh, of sugar uh, requires uh, long tracts of uh, fertile land, large quantities of far good, and mainly the protections about uh, from against or indigenous and foreign attacks. Uh, and this is what, uh, after some failures, uh, the Crown tried to provide, and after there was some security against both indigenous and the foreigners, the uh, sugar production started to, to thrive in Brazil, basically because there were many good conditions like flood fertile line, uh, for the land, uh, good, it was enough sun, the climate was efficient, 
And, uh, and <coughs> the most important thing, there was a, a lot of demand for sugar in Europe. So uh, the planting of sugar also caused, uh, has uh, the uh, side effect, because either enslavement or uh, coercion for trade, uh, death or uh, of, of indigenous people, or be, they being driven out uh, to the to the hinterland. At the same time, uh, Brazil was probably, if not, I guess, the first country. I'll later in sort of more about it. Uh, that received most African enslaved Africans. So it caused mass transfer of Africans to Brazil uh, and great destruction to the indigenous population. Also, Europeans were uh, driven to the colony with the government incentive, but uh, some, some of them were also forced to move to the colonies as exiles, not very different from uh, the Virginia company here, uh, but many of them also because it affected uh, better perspectives than what they had at home. And capital from different sources also contributed uh, to uh, this process. And well, here, this is a slide that I know sort of like, so it shows uh, the Africans working uh, and obviously more, more in the sugar production itself, and then it's more uh, supplying victuals for both Europeans and the Africans, uh, and uh, so on. Okay. Uh, and, but I think that the most striking, one of the most striking things about all of this process that involved all of these populations, the indigenous population, the African population, and the European population, and all of this suffering that was involved into it is that it produced a product that would be consumed almost entirely on the different side of the ocean and on a different hemisphere. Not only that, but we tend to focus very much on the Industrial Revolution that happened in Britain, and indeed it was a very remarkable process, but the sugar production worked in a totally interesting process. You did not have all this kind of uh, medical machines, at the steam machine in the, the revolution, but it required a production line, division of labor, uh, specialization, and hierarchy. And the line of production should be very tightly coordinated, otherwise it lose everything that all the work and money that it had spent until then, if the sugar bird or was well qualified. So this is uh, one of the sketches of different stages of the production. This is where you dry the sugar. Uh, so sugar did not only uh, trans it, it certainly transformed the coast of northeast Brazil and other parts of South America also the part of the Atlantic, uh, sugar production, but it also transformed uh, the economy. If not transformed, it enhanced or uh, provided incentives to the economies of uh, the other places that were involved in, the, in its trade. So most of the sugar produced in Brazil was channeled through Portugal. Portugal then was a small country, and strikingly still a small country. Uh, and a poor country which started to rely more and more on imports and also to support its population, especially in years of bad harvest. So one of the things that it provided was uh, bread, especially wheat and white was not bread, big bread, but uh, wheat and, and white were to sustain the Portuguese population. Also, uh, manufactured products Okay, these are uh, Dutch linens, and a, lo a large part of the sugar produced in Brazil was eventually distributed in the Netherlands, mainly in Amsterdam, and also to a certain point refined it. So the Netherlands also benefited 
both by re-exporting sugars to other places in Northern Europe and elsewhere, and also exporting uh, products to Portugal and Brazil, both from these other countries out in Europe and also local products such as these manufactured linens and other manufactured items. Uh, it also reached here, you might find it a little bit homish, this, oh, sorry, I'll come back to this, something went wrong, the picture didn't get there, but uh, also, uh, also, it uh, involved to a very uh, small extent North America. It was a very important product that was featured <coughs> here in Newfoundland, which was cut. Uh, the uh, Catholic diet uh, forbade consumption of meat during Fridays and some other days. And for historic and cultural reasons, uh, the fish that became very popular in Portugal and still is very popular is cod. Uh, I don't know why, for instance, herring did not get so popular in Portugal or salmon as it did elsewhere. But, uh, after being very much involved in the cod uh, fishery in the 16th century, the Portuguese moved out to their uh, areas that <coughs> had more uh, greater presence in and gave it to the British, uh, the English, and, and the French. But they would go all the way to Newfoundland to, uh, to take cod and take it sometimes directly to Brazil. So what we are seeing here is an involvement of the entire Atlantic Ocean. We have, this, of course, the slave trade with Africa, we have the cod in North America, we have Portugal, Netherlands, and the Atlantic Island that provided the most consumed product in terms of volume. In Brazil, there was one. So both in the Canary Islands, that belong to Castile, and uh, the Madeira Islands uh, in Portugal. Also, uh, it increased in uh, refine, uh, refining of sugar. But uh, the main, at that time, the main refining center moved from Antwerp, uh, as many other things, to Amsterdam. And sugar uh, is produced on, on these cones. Sorry. The, the upper part of the cone, which is the upside down, provides the uh, whiter sugar. And the uh, lower part is some browner sugar, not getting into details, uh, so we can certainly talk more about that. But uh, you can do that process over and over again and get a wider sugar. Uh, it's better to do that closer to the consumption center, because then you can decide how much uh, labor and food you're going to spend on it, uh, especially because it, it can also get full during the voyage. So Amsterdam was closed enough to uh, the consumption centers, and it also was a hub, and it benefited from it, and there was an upsurge of sugar refineries. This is, uh, at that point, they did not have, I think quite recently, they did not have numbers on the houses in Amsterdam, so they have these signs predicted by the houses, and this was a sugar refinery, and here is the sugar loaf of that mountain in Rio, named after this sugar loaf that comes from that world that we saw in the other, uh, in the other slide. Uh, also, the greater supply of sugar brought about uh, an expansion in sugar consumption and also a diversification and of sugar <coughs> consumption. There is a, a large debate to what extent and when sugar became a more popular product, it became consumed by more people and lower class people. Uh, I think the most influential work about that is certainly by Sidney Mintz, which has been uh, debated since now. But as we saw, there were different grades of sugar, and sugar could be uh, consumed in different quantities and different qualities at different times. So this picture by Peter Bruchel, I don't remember the other or the other, uh, shows a landlord presenting a sugar loaf to uh, his peasant. So he might have done one cake at once, or he might have spared to uh, consume it uh, sporadically. Uh, so. But what it, uh, it clearly shows is that sugar did reach lower classes in different levels and 
different qualities. Also, uh, the whole consumption of sweets became much more <coughs> sophisticated. It was a process that started earlier on. It only increased in its status quo. Here we see different sorts of sweets that were produced. I think if you want to learn more about it, we can do that discussion. Uh, also, in terms of, of profession, we have uh, the a specialization of, of uh, men that dedicated themselves in producing more sophisticated sweets, and these uh, these were the confectioners, and they were organized into guilds, and their profession was regulated. At the same time, that women uh, made at home more popular sweets that they sold either at home and or on the streets. That here, this brought about many social problems because uh, young people who spend some of the money that were given by the parents for them to shop in sweets, and this also brought a lot of regulation on sugar consumption. Uh, but all these changes that we see here, both uh, in South America and in Europe, and to and also in Africa and other places. Uh, this was only possible because sugar was traded profitably. If the sugar trade was not profitable, it wouldn't have been possible. Okay. So uh, the merchants who traded in sugar, they seized on the techniques, uh, the mechanisms the institutions that already exist and were evolving and developing at that time. And this could be considered a period of relatively maturation of much of the trading techniques that have uh, developed during the late Middle Ages and the early 15th and 16th century. Uh, but sugar being a uh, a valuable product is not was not a super valuable product such as woolen that had in Spanish America. It was also it became also entangled in the uh, in the warfare between the Hispanic monarchy and the emerging Dutch Republic. The Netherlands became independent from the Habsburgs and they fought against it. Dutch all, but also with the Englishmen. So sugar was one of the most important, actually, uh, uh, war prizes taken by the privateers, especially because uh, it was usually uh, the sugar ships were smaller. They didn't have usually did not carry weapons, and when they did carry cannons, they did not have gunmen. So it was basically was the only deterring factor. Well, this picture is uh, more about the, uh, the Battle of Gibraltar between the Dutch and the Spaniards. I like it because it has all this uh, blind fire that we have. Uh, and this Okay. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we, the work of merchants, most merchants were resident merchants, they did not travel to their things. And most of their work were, was office work, and was very tedious, and they worked for very long hours on paperwork, writing letters, writing down their accounts, copying their accounts, summing, dividing, checking if what if the reports that they received matched the uh, the records that they had, checking if people were not cheating them, checking if there were better business opportunities, calculating where they could get more profit from. So we, uh, I, I shouldn't say we, but uh, some, sometimes the focus on early modern history is on peasants, on artisans, 
or nobles and uh, and merchants sometimes seems like these people that were prospering without having much work and it was actually they were working for very long hours in the kind of work that is very familiar for us which is office uh, So some of this is in institutions that default, uh, that developed during this period. One of them is the uh, is the exchange market. Here is the Amsterdam Bourse. It has not been invented in Amsterdam. Actually, a very similar uh, building uh, to this was the was the London Exchange that had been built a few years earlier. Both of them were built after the Antwerp Bourse that also was built after the Bruges Bourse, which look like the Fundaki in uh, Venice and the word Fundaco in, in Venetian comes from the Arabic uh, Funduk, which is the word still used for hotel. So it's, it's uh, an institution that has a long history, but its role and importance has been evolving. And, cert and certainly the Amsterdam course was a landmark in the history of the exchange and trade. Uh, other institutions that did not start at that point was certainly developed another uh, is uh, the insurance market. So insurance probably started in medieval Italy, but uh, it certainly thrived in the Netherlands, uh, where in the late, uh, the final years of the 16th century, the uh, insurance chamber was established. It was supposed to adjudicate all cases referring to insurance. And it's very symptomatic that the first case that it decided about was a case regarding a cargo a shipment of sugar from Brazil, actual shipment that was never sent. So the, uh, the policyholders wanted to have their money back, uh, but they didn't. And that's what it was. Another uh, important uh, just a second to me. that had medieval origins were the seal laws. What is a seal law? Uh, well, the seal law is basically a loan where when someone uh, Lend some money to someone else, let's say of the year, will be traveling to Brazil. So I uh, lend him $100, and he will go there and trade him whatever he wants. And when he comes back, if he comes back safe and sound with the, proceed, uh, with the proceedings of, uh, of his uh, business, he is supposed to pay me back the same hundred dollars plus a fixed uh, interest rate, let's say thirty dollars. Let's say so he must pay me back one hundred thirty. To make sure he does so, he pledges a specific property. Okay. At the same time, I shoulder the risk if something happens to him or the goods, uh, only if it's harmed by pirates, privateers, or other attackers. Fire and water in shipwreck, uh, shipwreck or leakage, or something else. Okay? So, this means that he doesn't have a problem of uh, what is called in the literature, of the legal literature, uh, risk majeure, uh, but all the commercial risk, theoretically, is on him. Okay. <coughs> if he fails in his uh, commercial operations, it's his problem. He has to pay me back 130, no matter what, except for those people. Okay? So, uh, in the literature about the sugar trade, this kind of operation, uh, is usually more associated to insurance because for the smaller trader, it works as an insurance. It doesn't have to worry about it. And that's actually how Canada's 
and juries made it legal because uh, it was not usury, usury because the, uh, the lender was shouldering all the risk. So it looked like uh, insurance. But at the same time, it was also credit operation for <coughs> reasons, but also had elements of commercial of the commercial agency arrangement. Big YSL, because instead of going directly to Brazil and coming back, we could take my money and travel around to other places, continue to make money, and pay me back inside of a few months, in a few years. So that's one problem. But the most problem in the case of the uh, greatest uh, issue, in the case of the sugar trade, that usually that Repayment was not made in cash, uh, meaning coins, but in sugar to be purchased in Brazil at a fluctuating price. So I have here uh, a, a quote The uh, borrower is supposed to purchase from the best, whitest, and driest sugar available in that land uh, for the price that would be worth for cash and will purchase the aforesaid sugar for the cheapest price possible. So that brings about the question, how the lender would know all that? What was the cheapest price, which was the driest and widest sugar at that land available at that time? So that only happened because the information system between Brazil and Portugal, and also to the landlords, was effective enough to verify this information. Okay? Not only to verify, but also to enforce this contract. Well, we remember that if the agent or borrower did not comply, his property would be forfeited. So here comes another problem. The uh, pledged or mortgage uh, property, we would usually think about a house or real estate, but in this case it was usually a shared in the ship. Most of the borrowers were seamen, uh, so there were ship masters, ship pilots, or other people that had shares in ship. Okay? So, as we probably are aware of, ships are movable properties. So, if you mortgage a share in a ship, and the ship can sail away all the way to Asia, what kind of a collateral is that? Right? So, it works out because you could track down ships. Of course you could track down ships. Well, first of all, ships are bigger than people. But also, uh, ship property was divided into uh, there were a few owners of the ship, usually six, eight, four, three, but usually more than two. Why so? Because of the shipwrecks, you don't lose all the uh, all your investment. That's so called pooling capital and sharing the risk. Okay? This was the norm everywhere in early modern Europe, and also to a large extent, also in Okay, so also you have a crew. It's not a single person uh, sailing the yacht. So the fact that you have many people, many stakeholders in a shipping operation, also the shippers, the people who are loading, the uh, consigners that are waiting for the for the goods, uh, all of these were stakeholders. So that meant that there were many people monitoring the fate of that ship. Okay? The other thing that you could have the property of that chair to your name and wait until you find out where that ship ended. Okay? So you would be, uh, the property would be nominally yours and de facto after some time until you track it down. Okay? Well, uh, Now, things uh, changed a little bit in the 1620s. What happened in the 1620s? 
1869, there was a truce signed by the uh, Dutch Republic and the Hispanic monarchy that at that time included Portugal, its colonies, of course, Brazil, and also the southern Netherlands, what our day is basically uh, Belgium and Luxembourg. Okay. In 1621, this truce elapsed and warfare resumed, not only resumed, but escalated. And so this is again a fight between Portuguese and Dutch. And here we see that the Portuguese uh, caravel trying to uh, run away. And it also, also followed uh, all this warfare by uh, a very active and recrudescent uh, pirating by Muslims from North Africa, okay? Moroccan, Turkish, and so on. This is a graffiti Malta uh, that speaks one of their most popular uh, ships called the Shadda. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, so at that point, there was also a shift in the patterns of the contracts uh, of the uh, contract uh, terms of the Silla. Payments, instead of being made in sugar, started to be requested in coins. Coins have also their problems, and you will see one of them that is the basement. You just say that one coin now values, uh, has a nominal value that is higher than its, uh, uh, than its uh, intrinsic metallic value, which is actually what happened here in a Spanish coin that circulated in Portugal, but you can evade it by indexing they circulate points to imaginary points. I know that sounds crazy to the Americans, to North Americans, to South Americans, that makes perfect sense. We use that during the 80s, a big time. Uh, so you basically have an imaginary point that, that is stable, and you adjust uh, the, uh, the rate to the imaginary, uh, to the actual circulating points. This is easier to do than checking the quality and price of sugar in Brazil at a time that communications are not working so well. Okay? Here, I'm sorry you didn't see it so well, but here uh, the sugar is being placed into a test, and so this is the time, the best time for you to see <coughs> what is the quality of the sugar inside the test. Uh, so, I was uh, very lucky to find one Ceylon and the insurance policy that was taken out to insure that loan. Okay? So, the interest, lay, uh, the interest rate on that loan was 40%, which was higher than the rates before, with, and it's sensible because of the warfare. But not much higher. Before it was 25, 30 percent. Well, it's of course much more, but still not so dramatic. I guess. Uh, there was an insurance deductible of 8.66. That means that if the insurance did not cover uh, the, the full amount. So the uh, and insurance premium, uh, the insurance was taken out in Lisbon in this case, and not in uh, in major. Uh, in larger European financial centers such as Amsterdam, Antwerp, or Porto. Okay. The insurance premium was 14.25, so that means that the uh, lender's expected profitability without force majeure, except for deductible part of force, uh, was uh, 25.75. So when we think about profitability, and mainly the literature on the, on the sugar trade, usually focuses on the price gap, the price gap between Brazil and Europe, being Portugal, the Netherlands, England, whatever, and uh, takes out transportation costs 
and fixation. So a silom also deducts fixation and transportation costs, it's all included. So this 40% would be net clear of fixation and transportation costs. Okay? But that literature doesn't take much into account the risk, how much of the risk, and here we have how much the risk cost, which was 40.25%. Of course, this, this is all about expectation. Both the 40% is the expected profit, and it, which should be for the borrower higher than that, otherwise, otherwise it wouldn't make sense to lend this amount. Okay? And this is the expected risk by uh, the, uh, the underwriters of the insurance policy. Okay? Uh, but there's another element besides the risk that is opportunity cost. I don't know how much of you are familiar with the term. Opportunity cost is what else you could be doing with the same capital that you're investing into an enterprise, into a venture. In our days, we take uh, blue chips as uh, the, the base, uh, as a ben benchmark for opportunity cost. So if, if you land, to Obama, it's probably not going to break. And then uh, that, that's something that you have relatively low risk, and you could receive basically not much if you land to American uh, government. But that's your opportunity cost. But you can think about other stuff that you could be doing with that money, and when you are thinking about where to invest it. And usually everyone is thinking, where he can get more money. So uh, at that time, uh, the 5% the was the amount that the Portuguese church allowed people, merchants, to lend to each other. Uh, but we find uh, cases in which uh, these, uh, in, in financial operations, this interest rate would reach 25%, such as dealings with bills of exchange, that were supposed to be not paid out, and they go back uh, to the drawer, so this could uh, yield up to 25%. And it's more or less the same in the Netherlands. Uh, the, at that time, the market, in the Netherlands, the market uh, interest rate was about 5%, uh, but also there were different operations that could reach the bank. So if we take into account the opportunity cost, how much of a profit is that? Is it a high profitability? Is it a high profitability? And how much does, and that's all about the capital, the rewards of the capital, but how much the tedious, arduous, continuous work of the merchant worth? So how much is left, or how much a merchant would like to be rewarded for his work. But he said, well, he's in so long, he's not doing much. He lends the money, he receives the money back, fixed interest rate, and now we point. So it's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of work, sorry. Um, I don't want to answer this question right now. I actually want to discuss the questions because I think they're very important to the understanding not only of the sugar trade or the Atlantic economy, but about the formation of capitalism, which, uh, which is the question that became again fashionable and I think in, in a good time. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we'll open up the floor for our for questions, it seems like the underlying, you, you provide us here an equation, right? And you're asking what, well, I guess, what's the, what's the, what's the profitability of this trade, yeah. right? And, and that's kind of captured in what the merchant's expecting to, yeah. to receive. Yeah. Why, why is somebody in this trade, what, what's the, what's the, what's the, what are they deriving from <coughs> Questions? Discussion? So, 
you said it's a timely question, and I, I agree with you very much. And I wonder if, if you see, you know, the, the, what's happening in capitalism today, the whole states going bankrupt. Um, you think, like, it sounds to me like your argument is that you know, capitalism really isn't that profitable. Like, this is just well, I'm just saying that if you, I'm, I'm very wary of my about being an acronym, so sometimes history provides insights to understand the present, and I'm happy about that. I think there are certain commonalities about human behavior, because if it were, we would not be able to study history if there were different creatures, different things. So we expect some kind of uh, commonalities in behavior uh, throughout time, and Case. Okay? Uh, but I think if, if you take that back to, uh, if you think about opening a startup, okay? You don't go to Wall Street, but you just think about opening a startup. Think, why should it do that? Well, it's a lot of, well, for many people, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of uh, investment. And some people take loans and not everyone profits from it. Okay, not everyone becomes part of the And so I think that's still a pertinent question. So we, we tend only to look at, at those cases that that go that went well. But not everyone went well. And uh, it's also a lot of work. The thing here. Of course, there is a lot of prejudice against all that. That comes from all comes all the way from one from the Bible, but certainly uh, the evil uh, theology and law uh, did not help. Uh, but at the same time, there is all all the fortune plays a great role in it. So of course, if this ship sinks or doesn't, it changes how much all these people gain from it. And and the, the I think that the interference of uh, of fate also makes them think a little bit suspicious because it's not that if you're a sandler you take some leather and you work on it for some time and you have a shoe. Well, this is something that is is more transparent and well, of course, something you, your shop can burn down or something. Like but usually things don't happen. Uh, in here, uh, you have things that can change uh, dramatically uh, into terms of, <coughs> of, of, of fate. And that's cap that's calculated. That's the insurance premium. But that's what they try to calculate. Of course, it's not not always work because you can have uh, a sudden attack. You can have uh, a privateer fleet that they do not. Uh, know about them, or uh, uh, exactly the, 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 they had the misfortune of being uh, right where the Muslims, pirates, were waiting for, and they thought it would be in a different place. So that, they tried to calculate, but it's also certainly something not very precise. On, on the, uh, what I wanted to say also, on the average, that worked. If that wouldn't work, that wouldn't be sugar trade trade, would not be trade so, But that's the big, that's the, the macro. Okay? And the big picture is worked, and, that's, and we saw the consequences of it. But if you look at the individual cases, it not always worked out well for them. And if you want to engage into it, you were taking the risk, and you were also taking a lot of work. And people that do that, they want to be rewarded for it. Well, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm raising capitalism here. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I just want to ask you about what were the kind of defaults that uh, happened on these loans? What levels of defaults happened on these loans? And uh, was there, in a sense, a shift in ownership of hips from yeah. shipmen to Merchants, and therefore, is the incident in some way can be seen in some sense as a concentration of different parts of the whole sugar chain from you know, uh, capital. Uh, 
shape of transformation itself into motion hands, and therefore, is this in, can one see in that framework? Uh, I'm not sure if, if I understood. You, you asked how, how much of default in payments? Default in payment, and therefore, how much of the ownership of ships move from, say, shipment to merchants? Okay. So here I have a problem with the sources. Unfortunately, uh, the port sources disappeared for that period. So I cannot track them. Uh, what I see sometimes are parts of the tourney. So in some cases, there are parts of the tourney for people to get, uh, to, to charge and get the ownership of those shoe ships in different places. So that's do happen. But sometimes it's not clear why it's happening. So it could be default in, or in this kind of, uh, of appointment, but could be something else. It could be, for instance, uh, uh, it was just a shipment, and the ship mark master did not <coughs> deliver it because, or did not deliver it properly, or, or, he, or any other sort of uh, dispute with the uh, ship share, share owner. Sometimes also between merchants that want own money to each other, and many merchants had to shares. So this was one of the ways to pay out of that. So unfortunately, I cannot answer that a lot. So I have a question about the networks that were connecting all these ports uh, regarding the sugar trade. Did the uh, Jewish networks and the uh, new Christian merchant networks play uh, play an important role in this process? Well, I love this Our question. special role? I'm working on a monograph on it, <laughs> and it costs less than this book. Um, <laughs> so, uh, they did and they did not. Uh, the, the merchants of Jewish origin, they had a prominent role in the sugar trade. Uh, they were certainly the majority of merchants in Portugal had Jewish origins for historical reasons that it was explained. I just want to take too much time. It's not everywhere, but uh, like an average, few were the majority. And also uh, in Brazil, as a, as a Portuguese colony, uh, many, uh, not many, but a number of these uh, new Christians, they moved to the Netherlands where they became open Jews, but they were part of the same group, uh, relatives of each other, or, uh, well, members of this same group of, my, my, of the same minority uh, of Portuguese that had to join. Okay? And there is a lot of stress in a kind of a canonic literature uh, saying that all, all of this trade in this condition was only possible because of this diaspora. As it was a closely knit diaspora. I argue that it was not so closely knit, but still it was important. But it was not important in every kind of transaction, and certainly not in this transaction. So the guy here that uh, was sailing, the, the traveler, the borrower, was not an Nearly all the shipmasters, all people who did transportation, were not did not have Jewish origin, either in Portugal or in the Netherlands. I only found one case okay, in hundreds. Uh, here, uh, the uh, investor, the lander, is a good Christian. Actually, he's uh, who lives in, in Lisbon. Who's acting through a third party in uh, in Porto? The insurers, I only have the identity of three of them. There were many more, but I only have the, the identity of three of them. One was New Christian, the other two were Old Christians. So, why was it so? My understanding is because this is a more easily verifiable. Section. So it's not, you do need to have that amount of information. You know that the ships, either the ship sank, or yeah, the ship yeah, didn't yeah. sank. Yeah. Have many, there were many people tracking down the ship for the reasons I explained. So not only if the ship runs away, but if something happened to the ship. 
so you have more information about that. So this was a simpler kind of transaction, and therefore it was not, it was usually more heterogeneous. Okay, the same about insurance. Not only so, but it was beneficial to have heterogeneous transactions in these cases because it enriched the information that one received. If you only talk to the same people, if you only talk to your classmates, you'll only know what your classmates know. But if you come here and talk to people from the law school or from economics and medicine school, you may find out very interesting things. So the fact that you were people that belong to different groups may that they could get sort of thing. So if over the long what did a merchant expect from Planners, short planners, sometimes they made a killing, they made twenty percent in the year. But most of the time they were happy if they made between six and eight percent, right? What did the merchant expect to make from this? That's a good question, man. I, I, I'm actually looking for that answer. And, uh, I think that they would like to make uh, more, certainly more than 5%. And I think that they, and they will certainly want to make something that would cover that risk. So it should be at least. Would they stay in business at 5%? Only if they think the loop. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Dr. Arnold, this has been confiscated, but it's confiscated, and we were.